Good morning, everyone. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land we are gathered today and broadcast from today. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. With our online participants based elsewhere or interstate, I also pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land from wherever you may be joining us today. For those of you who I haven't met, my name is Anke Leroux. I'm one of the organizers of MU 2021. Um, and it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our Dean um, of, the, um, of the Faculty of Business and Economics and the head of the Monash Business School, Professor Simon Wilkie. Thanks, thank you. Well, thanks everybody for coming to this and it's a real pleasure to actually see people in person <laughs> for the first time in a long time and see people without masks. Uh, so you can actually, you know, see some facial expressions and get some feedback. Uh, and thanks everybody who's online as well. Uh, so I too would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the members of the Kulin Nation, and, uh, which we're gathered today, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. But uh, I want to start by saying how important this conference is to us. Um, I say this to several conferences, but in particular, uh, if you've seen a copy and the, <clears throat> well, sadly, many trees died, but uh, we now have a paper copy of the strategic plan <laughs> that's being distributed. Um, there's extra copies up on floor 10. Uh, for the university. The university has chosen to uh, focus on a couple of areas of impact uh, going forward over the next 10 years. And so from the strategic plan of Monash, the area of sustainability and dealing with sustainability issues and having a real world impact on those issues is front and foremost uh, at the strategic priorities of the university. So I think this conference is impeccably well-timed <laughs> uh, to demonstrate our commitment and the relevance of our work uh, and how we can have an impact on those areas. Uh, so uh, as the first, one of the first conferences that we are back in person, um, I think uh, we should view this not just as a conference, but let's try and um, move forward after the conference to think what we can distill from the learning here uh, and promote it um, inside the university to show how our research is having an impact and the areas that we're working on are aligned um, with the priorities of the university. You know, frankly, something, you know, in our areas, we haven't really been that great at it in the past. Um, we've been great doing our research, but perhaps not so great in promoting it internally. Uh, to the other stakeholders around the university. Uh, I think that's true of economists generally. <laughs> um, but uh, this, I think, is really, um, really, as I said, impeccably well-timed. And I look forward to uh, joining you at the start of the conference, but then I have to go off and do more mundane things, unfortunately. <laughs> but thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Simon, for taking time out of your busy schedule to officially open the workshop. And at this point, I'd like to thank the faculty for its continued support. Um, it's been running for now five or six years. Wow. And yeah, it's very encouraging for us and, and great to see that the faculty sort of recognizes the importance of this area of research. Okay, so um, on behalf of the organizing committee, Nicola Thomas and Wang Li, and also our event manager, uh, Holly Travers, you can't see her right now. Um, I would also like to really extend my warmest welcome to all of you. Um, we are so excited to have this event here in person as well as online. It's uh, very, very exciting for us to sort of move away from everyone being on, on screen. Um, it is one of the first face-to-face -face events that the uni, uni is um, hosting after the extended lockdown. And um, luckily, a lot of the restrictions that we thought we would have to live with over the next couple of days have been lifted as of Friday, so we no longer have to wear a mask. We can actually have our breaks in a kind of normal fashion, um, don't have to isolate while eating and things like that. 
but some things are still unfortunately in place. And uh, one of those things is that we don't have uh, access, free access into the building and on the, onto the floors. So it's, uh, the building still remains under swipe access only. Um, so please be reminded if you want to leave level nine, uh, you have to let one of us know so that we can arrange for you to get back in. Um, this is, I do apologize for the inconvenience. We have tried to make that as the need to leave level nine is as little as possible. Um, our catering will be in the next room. Um, so we, at least we don't have to move away from that. Bathrooms are located next to the lifts on this uh, floor level as well. But we do understand that if you need some air, um, you need to sometimes leave and we will make our best to do our best to accommodate that. Uh, on the point of the catering, I was told because it's all carpeted areas to please not move food away. Um, I tell my kids that I don't think I need to tell you that, but anyway, I was told. So in terms of how this workshop is going to function as a hybrid event, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dan here who has thrown everything in terms of AV at the event possible. Um, for this to work as well as it can possibly do, um, I would like to ask those who are presenting to remain sort of here, so to speak, into the, the microphone. Um, that ensures that people online can hear you and that you are also seen. Um, presenters online, please have your presentations ready to screen share when it's your turn and make sure your mic and camera is on. Uh, also, if you would like to get time reminders of the session chairs, I would advise you to have to, once you have as shared your presentation, to have the chat window open because the session chair will give you the time reminders via the chat. Um, on the subjects of session chairs, thank you very much to all the session chairs who agreed um, to this very important role of making facilitating the interaction between the online and in-person attendees and presenters and participants. Um, to make this task as easy as possible for you, can I please ask uh, session chairs to be seated um, behind the gentleman in the in the um, stripy shirt, I think it is. So that's that's uh, the computer is there set up. Um, you can field any questions that come through the chat, and you have a view of the of the room as well. So that's the the easiest place to be session chair. Um, we have a sanitizer station set up there for to use before you start your session. Uh, please do not move the microphone. It's set up to pick up sort of um, questions and, and things from the room. Uh, if you are in the room asking questions, please remember to speak very loudly and clearly so that we don't have to move the microphone around, but people can actually hear you. Um, if for those of you on Zoom, if you would like to ask a question, um, please use either the chat function. So then the session chair will read out the question for you or if you would like to ask it in person, um, you can use the raise hand function. And then when it's your turn, please make sure you have already your camera and mic switched on just to be as efficient as possible. Um, also we have for the session chairs on, on the desk there, we have uh, five minutes, 10 minutes and one minute reminder, um, little cards. For the 12 minute early career session, I would suggest we only use the one in the five minutes, um, just so that we have enough for discussion, three minutes for each paper. And for the normal sessions, you, you may want to use the 10, five and one minute reminders. Um, yeah, so then finally, uh, I would like to ask also the session chairs the same thing that I'm doing now. And that is um, just point to the, what's happening after the session once you've finished it. Uh, so we have now the workshop opening done. Um, we are moving into the keynote presentation. After that, there'll be a morning tea break. Um, and then uh, the first session of the day before lunch. So if you could just remind everyone where they have to, uh, where they should go and, and um, when to come back for the next session, that would be fantastic. Are there any questions at this point? Have I forgotten something, Holly? No, all good? All right. 
So now, um, with all the housekeeping done, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our very first ever keynote speaker of the Monash Environmental Economics Workshop. She's from the University of Queensland, Associate Professor Lana Friesen. Hello, Lana. Hi there. Um, so I'm, I remember meeting Lana for the first time at an experimental economics workshop um, in Sydney, or it might have been a conference. That was very early on in my career. And um, I was struck by how open she was and how approachable. And since then, we've had many, many discussions about um, our respective work. And I am very, truly very happy that uh, someone like Lana is a role model in our little research community in, in Australia. So Lana uses experimental methods to investigate many uh, very important issues in environmental economics. Uh, she has published her research in the top field journals and also in the lead leading general economics journals, such as Economic Journal and the European Economic Review. Her research really spans three major areas. Um, a large body of her work is focused on improving compliance within environmental regulation. And within this literature, she has made major contributions when it comes to uh, how to optimally target enforcement, effort, enforcement efforts. So for example, her work shows that regulators can reduce costs by moving firms at random into the target group and then only letting them leave the target group once a, um, the, an inspection of the firm reveals that it is, it is compliant. In other work, she and her co-authors compare the effects of, uh, on reporting, output and compliance between um, random audit and tournament audit, audit mechanisms in the presence of social observability. So while they find no strong effect of social observability, they do find that a tournament audit, uh, where the probability of inspection increases with the degree of estimated underreporting, yields lower output and higher reporting on average. So that's one area, uh, and I haven't had time to really overview it in, in great depth, but that's a major area of Lana's research. Another one uh, is about decision-making in complex environments, including aged care investments and consumer contracts. So for example, in the latter case, she and her co-authors have demonstrated um, the value of market assisted choice, so those search databases that you have, in a very novel experiment where they um, told users they could um, have an hour to search for the cheapest mobile phone plan, and some users only got um, the offline archive of provider websites, others uh, had access to the internet. Um, they were also asked to think aloud during their search, and then in the subsequent analysis of the uh, uh, screen capture movie recordings, they were able to reveal major procedural, so major shortfalls in procedural rationality, such as poor strategic thinking, um, about how to deal with choice overload, poor conceptual understanding, um, and cognitive and calculation er errors. So with this fine-grained approach, Lana and her co-authors were able to reveal a much more complex picture of how opportunities are missed, even if you spend a lot of time uh, searching, um, and even if you are aided by uh, market institutions. So her talk today, however, fits within the third stream of her research, uh, which is on environmental markets, where she has worked on uh, pollution auctions and carbon offsets. And I don't want to give too much away here because Lana does, did promise that uh, you will give us a taste of the literature as well as your recent insights in the, in the most recent work you've done. Um, so Lana also has been an adamant supporter of this workshop from day one. I don't think you've missed any of the workshops since 2015, have you? Uh, maybe not, no. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, given your research credentials and also your role in this community, I think you are the very fitting, very first keynote speaker of this event. And I look forward to your advice regarding the P's and Q's of variable allowance reserves in emission markets. Thank you, Lana. Over, over to you. Thank you. I'll share my slides.
All right, so I hope everyone's seen the slides now. Yes. Yeah, excellent, thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation and thanks for your uh, very kind introduction. It's my pleasure to be here today. I wish I could be there in person, but uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully joining you in a year in person. So this is uh, the paper I'm gonna to present today is uh, joint work with my colleague at UQ, Ian McKenzie, uh, with Lata Gangaharan, uh, who needs no introduction, and with Pam and Kears um, at RMIT. And the title of the talk is uh, Mind Your P's and Q's. Um, it's about variable allowance supply in the US Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Hang on, it's not going under the next screen. Why is that? Okay, so just by way of introduction and motivation for this particular paper, as environmental economists or economists generally, we're well aware of um, the benefits of using market-based instruments like cap and trade schemes when we're thinking about uh, controlling different types of pollutants. And one of the issues when you use a cap and trade scheme or a marketable permit scheme is how do you allocate the permits to the different polluting sources? And we see that auctions are being increasingly used in a variety of different uh, places around the world to allocate permits, either all of the permits or at least a good proportion of them. And as you'll be also aware, there's quite a few different ways that you can design an auction. And uh, one of the things that we see in these pollution permit auctions is a really interesting feature that's become quite common, is this idea of a variable allowance supply. So what is this? This means that uh, instead of just having a completely fixed uh, supply of allowances or permits, um, you augment that supply with an allowance reserve. And what is that? It's a separate quantity of allowances that you can use to either adjust the initial supply um, either up or down. And why might you want to do that? Well, you might want to do that because there's uncertainty about demand for permits and in particular uncertainty about uh, pollution control costs, pollution abatement costs. So as the auctioneer or the regulator, you might want to uh, use your allowance reserve to increase the supply of permits when you think the initial price in the auction is going to be too high. And conversely, um, you might want to take some supply out of the market if you think the initial price is going to be too low. Now, if you think the initial price is too high, you might want to try and adjust for that and keep it lower to prevent firms having to pay too high a cost for pollution abatement. You might think it's a bit strange that you want to um, take the supply out of the market when the price is too low, but the idea here is that you want to try and incentivize pollution abatement. You want to try, in particular, investment in new um, less polluting technologies in adoption and, and development of those technologies. So you want to try and keep the permit price from getting too low. So in particular, uh, what we do in this paper is we investigate one very particular uh, permit market, per permit auction, where they use variable allowance supply, and that is in the US Regional Greenhouse Gas Init Initiative, or REGI for short. And this particular design uses uh, two different allowance reserves, um, which are the Qs and associated with those two different trigger prices, which are the Ps, and that gives us the title. So I'll explain now a bit more about this market. I'm sorry, my computer does not want to advance unless I click that button. All right. So what is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and uh, Reggie for short? Well, this is a uh, US initiative that began in 20, 2008, and it regulates carbon dioxide from the power sector in, in 11 northeastern US states. And you can see on the right hand side there, the states that are involved in this particular scheme. It's been a pretty successful scheme um, because uh, since its inception more than 10 years ago, um, the emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, have decreased by more than 50%. And you can see they use, um, over time, they've been decreasing the cap that they allow as well. So more particularly, how does um, this scheme work and uh, how do they allocate the permits? Well, they use a quarterly auction of permits, um, court allowances. So I'm going to use the terminology of permits and allow allowances interchangeably here. And they use a multi-unit uniform price auction where each allowance or permit 
allows you to emit one tonne of CO2. And you can see there that uh, each auction generates quite a bit of revenue, so they're pretty substantial auctions. Uh, in the last couple of years, each quarterly auction has raised uh, around 100 to 150 US dollars, million dollars, and has generated more than 4 billion US dollars of revenue since inception. The revenue is generated back to the states and they use it to mainly invest in various types of energy efficiency type programs and um, helping consumers with uh, lowering their costs and things like that. So what we're particularly interested in this paper is looking at the two types of reserves that they have in this particular auction. And since 2014, they've had a cost containment reserve or a CCR. So this is the reserve that kicks in when the price is too high. Um, and interestingly for what we want to study is that this year they've also implemented uh, an emissions containment reserve. So that's a reserve that kicks in when the price is too low or an ECR. So I'll explain a bit more about those now. So this is a, a stylized representation of what the supply curve looks like in this particular auction. It's a variable supply curve. And uh, what we've got on the axis here is down here, we've got uh, allowances and millions of allowances and dollars per ton up here. Now, in a standard kind of auction with a fixed supply, you just have this $15 million, sorry, 15 million allowances. And this line would be totally vertical all the way up here. All right, so where, whatever demand was, the price would just vary accordingly. What happens in this variable supply system is they've got this cost containment reserve, which they've had for quite a long time now. And uh, these are the actual uh, numbers that are from the quarterly auction. So what happens is if the price in the auction here exceeds $13 a ton, then the cost containment reserve is activated, meaning they release more permits onto the auction, into the auction in order to try and keep the price down and they release these additional permits until either the price falls back to $13 or they run out of permits. They use up their whole reserve. Okay. Conversely, if you look down here, the emissions containment reserve down here, the ECR, this kicks in if the price is, um, the initial price in the auction is below this lower trigger price of $6, in which case they take permits out of the auction and put them into the reserve. And they do that until the price is back up to $6 or they completely filled up their reserve. So this is a way of keeping the price, uh, the price from getting too, um, too far out of these bounds. But the one thing I want to point out is uh, this kind of scheme sets up a soft price ceiling and price floor because if the demand is really, really high, so your demand curve was up here somewhere, you would still have a price that was higher than the upper trigger price. And similarly, if demand was really low down here, the price could fall below $6. A couple of other things to notice from the graph, there's $2.38, this is the reserve price in the auction. And my final thing I wanna point out from this graph here is if you look at these numbers on the bottom here, you'll see that the, uh, both of the reserves, the ECR and the CCR are actually quite large in the sense that they're about half of the size of this initial supply. I mentioned that because that's gonna in part motivate some of our parameter choices in the experiment, the lab experiment I'm gonna tell you about shortly. And finally, just a little bit more by way of background on Reggie. Uh, so there's these two trigger prices that they have, the upper and lower trigger price, and they uh, increased uh, year on year uh, by 7%, each of them, um, up until 2030. And you can see what that means is that over time, the two trigger prices are getting further and further apart. So this, what we're gonna call the price collar is actually getting wider and wider. So what do we do in this particular paper? Well, we're gonna use a lab experiment uh, to investigate uh, how this new institutional design uh, that has both upper and lower allowances, allowance reserves and their associated trigger prices are gonna affect regulatory outcomes. And just to preview what our results are gonna be, we find that the choice of the P's and Q's being the trigger prices and the size of the reserves um, has a significant impact on the outcome in the market. In particular, we're going to show that the chosen trigger prices, the P's, act as a sort of focal point. And as a result, the distribution of clearing prices is going to be bimodal in the auction. And what we show in this paper is this is due both to the institutional design, so it is expected to some degree, but we show it's exacerbated by subjects bidding behaviour in the auction. 
We also show, we also look at some of the comparative statics as well. Um, when we move, change some of the institutional design, we show that the equilibrium clearing prices are positively related to independent changes in both trigger prices. The quantity of the allowances sold is largely determined though by the initial supply in the auction and outcomes are more sensitive to changes in P's than Q's. All right, so let's get into the details. So a very brief literature review, I'm not gonna to spend too much time delving into it, but just to set the scene a little bit as to where our paper fits into this literature. So just to taking a really broad perspective, uh, there's a long history in environmental economics of studying so-called hybrid policies, environmental policies that include both uh, price and quantity dimensions in order to deal with uncertainty about abatement costs, marginal abatement costs. And this literature goes way back until the 70s and there's been a lot of literature uh, since then. So our um, paper fits into this very broad literature as well because we're studying a hybrid policy as well. There's a number of theoretical contributions um, that look at various types of variable supply and particularly in the environmental context. These tend to mostly focus on cost containment. So the uh, cost of the upper type of reserve because that's what we've mostly seen in practice to date. And these demonstrate the benefits of having that kind of variable supplies, variable supply for containing costs for firm, for firms and polluters, and also for efficiency. There's also quite a few, um, a number of experimental studies as well. And, uh, but these are in quite different settings than what we're doing in this particular paper. So I guess maybe the closest paper to ours is this one by Betral uh, in 2018. They explicitly study uh, the emissions containment reserve, uh, but only the emissions containment reserve, um, and that compared to a case of having no such reserve and how that affects auction outcomes. A number of other papers look at different types of price for floors and ceilings, such as uh, Strand Lane study hard price floors and, floors and ceilings, whereas we've got a soft price floor and ceiling. And a few other papers study uh, these variable supply uh, reserves in different emissions trading schemes, so in California and in the uh, EU emissions trading scheme. And these supply reserves, although they are variable supply auctions, they operate in quite distinct ways from in uh, Reggie. So what our main innovation is to, uh, first of all, study the two, the dual allowance reserves together. And within that, we are interested in studying how the institutional design, uh, by which I mean how you, your choices of the P's and Q's, how that influences the outcomes in this particular auction. Before I, I go into um, the experimental design or theory and experimental design, I thought I'd just say a few words by, about why we want to use an experiment in this particular context. So you might notice in the uh, literature review there, I didn't have a section on empirical work on this particular topic, uh, other than experiments, of course, but um, standard empirical work. Um, and that's because uh, even though you can look at the auction outcomes and you can get data on uh, the price, final price in the auction and who uh, got the permits and that kind of thing, there's no data available on uh, individual bidding in these auctions. And also, even if we had that data on individual bids, um, we don't have any information on the valuations of the bidders, so those always remain private information. So it makes it hard to analyze it empirically, and one of the things we can do in our lab experiment, of course, is we can observe exactly uh, what participants are bidding, and we give them their valuations so we know exactly how they're bidding relative to those known, well, known to us um, valuations. Our second big advantage is, is true of any kind of experiment, uh, but particularly relevant here, I think, and that is in our uh, an experiment, we're able to make ceteris paribus changes. So we can change either just one parameter at a time. So for example, we're gonna change uh, a trigger, one of the trigger prices while keeping everything else exactly the same. And of course, that's very difficult to achieve outside of a lab or an experimental context. And finally, uh, we have the ability to test these different institutional parameters in a way that you just cannot do in the real world. And in, in the real world, Reggie, they can't you know, try different things and see how that affects the outcomes. Whereas we have the luxury of being able to do that in our lab experiment.
All right, so before I get into the experimental design uh, and what exactly we do, we do have a fairly simple uh, stylized theoretical framework in the paper. It's in the appendix of our paper. So I'll just talk through a few of the things that we're able to show in that framework before we get into the experimental design. So I guess I'll say before I get into this, um, one of our the goals when we're designing the experiment is to capture what we think are the key aspects um, of this type of auction um, and abstract away from a, a lot of complications so we can focus on those particular things. And that one reason for that is to keep it relatively simple for the participants in our experiment to understand, because actually it's quite hard to explain even the verbal supply auction to them. So what's the framework? We've got a regulator who can sell a maximum of Q up about allowances or permits within each single auction to N firms. Firms demand at most two units or two allowances, and uh, they have the same value for both units. So this gives us a multiple unit auction, but this kind of simplest form that we can come up with. Uh, each firm is gonna have a private value for the allowances. And these values are distributed independently across the firms and drawn from a known distribution function. The distribution function is gonna be uniform because that's easy to, easiest to explain to our subjects. And when we think about the analogy to uh, real world permit markets, this private value is reflecting um, the instantaneous compliance cost for reducing pollution for the firms. So the idea here is um, you have some kind of a, abatement cost, uh, which is your private value, but you'd rather purchase a permit that allows you to keep polluting if that price of that permit's gonna be less than your value. Uh, we also here, we use a multiple unit uniform price auction a sealed bid, so there's just a single bid, and uh, it's uniform price. Everyone pays the same price for the permits they win, and that's equal to the highest losing bid. So we uh, keep things simple by abstracting away from a secondary market and banking of permits. Um, and again, that is so we can focus on the things we're most interested in, um, in this particular case. All right, so, uh, this is how we set up the variable allowance supply in our experiment. Hopefully you're thinking that figure looks pretty familiar to the one I showed you um, not very long ago when I gave you a generic one. So and essentially it is very similar to what I showed you previously in that we're gonna have here. So this is the supply curve in the auction in our experiment where Q upper bar here is the maximum number of allowances that we're gonna hold fixed across all our treatments. And that can be divided into this initial supply. And notice though that once we choose the initial supply, this Q2, this is gonna determine the cost containment reserve. So these things are not gonna be independent in our experiment because we've chosen to fix this maximum number up here. We've also got the ECR here and, uh, and Q1 determining that. And we've got the two trigger prices over here, which we're gonna call P2 for the upper one and P1 for the lower one. Finally, notice I've got no reserve price in my auction or the reserve price is zero, if you want to think it that way. And again, that's just to keep it simple um, because we don't really think that's gonna make much difference to the results in terms of comparing what's gonna happen when we change the, our institutional parameters. Right. So in this graph, I'm just overlaying that, that allowance supply with some demand curves, just to make sure you fully understand what I mean by um, how these trigger prices and reserves operate. So in the middle here, we've got, this is ex, this, these are demand curves for permits or allowances. If demand is as expected, so what the E stands for here, then the intersection here, the equilibrium is in this vertical part of the supply curve. Prices in between the two trigger prices here, and the quantity of allowances is just Q2. But what happens if demand is greater than we anticipate? Uh, then we're going to hit one of these horizontal parts of the supply curve. To think about what's happening here, if we didn't have this variable allowance supply, then the whole supply curve would just be completely vertical, right? Like we'd go all the way up here, and the price would go up to here somewhere. 
Yeah, so instead what's happening though is they're releasing more permits onto the market along here until the price drops down to the trigger price um, and then you stop releasing permits into the market. What's happening if demand is lower than expected down here? Well, then if uh, we didn't have any allowance uh, reserves here, then the price would be down here, right? And it would be below the trigger price. So we take permits out of the supply, out of the market until the price goes back up to P two to one. And finally, notice what I said before, if demand is really high, then you can be up here. The price can go above P two to two. So we have a soft price ceiling and a soft price floor down here. So in the experiment, this is exactly how uh, the supply curve is going to work. Before we get to that, I'll just talk about some of the theoretical results that we can derive. So first of all, given our very stylized framework I've just described to you, we show that for any given submitted demand schedule, using these dual allowance reserves uh, can result in this bimodal distribution of clearing prices. And th those modes are gonna align with the relevant trigger prices. Uh, I guess when I've shown you the supply curve, it's fairly intuitive that you're gonna get a lot of times the demand curve hitting on those flat parts of the supply curve, which is why we're getting this particular result. We also get some fairly intuitive um, additional results as well, that the larger the size of the reserve, so the larger those flat portions, ceteris paribus, the more likely the price is gonna equal the trigger price. Again, I think it's pretty intuitive. And the larger the variance of the demand, the more likely the price equals a trigger price as well. We also derive using our framework, some comparative static predictions, um, which are that a decrease in either trigger price uh, will reduce the clearing price and increase the number of units sold. Again, I think that's fairly intuitive, but it's, uh, we show formally that that is actually the case. Second thing here is that an increase in either Q1 or Q2 uh, will decrease the clearing price and increase the number of units sold. So Q2 is the initial supply. And finally, we've got some uh, individual bidding results. Because we've got a pretty complicated multiple unit auction, we can't derive any uh, equilibrium bidding strategies, explicit ones. But what we can show is that uh, it's weakly dominant. So remember each uh, bidder in our auction is gonna have, uh, can bid for two units, right? So what we show it's weakly dominant for each bidder to bid their value for the first unit, uh, but to bid weakly lower than their value for the second unit. So it's important for us to show this because it means that there's an incentive for demand reduction or bid shading which is exactly the same as in traditional multiple unit auctions without allowance reserves. So in those auctions, there's a problem, if you like, of bid shading, demand reduction, and we show this also holds in our more complicated uh, variable supply environment. All right, let's get a little bit more into the uh, exact experimental design. So as I already said, we. Um, set up the auction mechanism to be similar to what we observe in the real world situation we're interested in. And that is it's a sealed bid, multiple unit, uniform price auction, where the price equals the highest rejected bid. The supply in the auction is exactly as I've supplied, um, described to you already, in that there are two trigger prices, an emissions containment reserve, an ECR, and a cost containment reserve, as I has described earlier. Each bid is bidding for two units, with the same value for both units. And those values are drawn uh, independently uh, from a uniform distribution be of between zero and $10 in cent, one cent increments. We don't really place any restriction on bidding. There's no upper limit or anything like that, other than we, allow, we uh, ensure that bids are non-negative and they can only bid in cent amounts. Uh, each market we set up in the experiment contains four bidders who are bidding for a maximum of six units. So Q upper bar here is six. And the goal uh, or the incentives in the experiment uh, are to try and make as much profit as you can. That's how you paid in the experiment. You make profit by buying a permit 
in the auction for a price here that is lower than the value that you've been given. As I said before, this is equivalent to uh, buying a permit that allows you to pollute, costs you less than your value in the real world would be the cost of pollution abatement. Okay, so in the experiment, we have five different treatments and you can see them there with the different parameters that we vary. Um, so first thing to notice is across all five treatments, the emissions containment reserve is exactly uh, always two units, but we vary across the other treatments, the other parameters um, in this table. So first of all, we've got the control treatment up here uh, where we've got four unit, four permits is the initial supply in the auction if no triggers are reached or anything like that. Two units are in the cost containment reserve. These numbers always have to add up to our, our maximum number of six. And over here, we've got the trigger prices. Um, the upper one, $6.66, and the lower one, $3.33. So the trigger prices we chose here, these ones we just chose to be sort of equally spaced, if you like, across our value distribution between zero and 10. With these numbers here for the quantities, uh, thinking back to when I showed you the real numbers in the Reggie uh, auction at the very beginning, I made the point that actually quite a lot of permits that are in that cost containment reserve, about half of the uh, initial supply. So we tried to align roughly with that in, in our initial uh, control treatment, having quite a lot of permits in this cost containment reserve. And then we've got um, our two initial treatments here are uh, do you want me to answer the, some of the chat questions while I'm going through, I guess? So a question, uh, are all the experimental parameters known to the bidders? Yes, yes, so they know, I assume you mean the, um, parameters of the supply curve and all that kind of thing. And yes, yes, they are. Yep. We spend quite a lot of time explaining exactly how uh, the variable supply is going to work in the auction. All right, so we've got the control treatment and then we've got two treatments, uh, low P2 and low P1, where all we change is one thing compared to the control. And this is we change either the uh, upper or the highest trigger price here we reduce it from $6.66 to $5, but keep all the other parameters exactly the same as in the control. And then a low P1, we reduce uh, P1 here down to $2, but keep all the other parameters exactly the same. So we're always comparing back to the control from each treatment back to the control because we only change one parameter as we go from the control to those particular treatments. So here, obviously, we're interested in seeing how changes in those trigger prices affect the outcomes in the auction in the market. We also have two treatments where we vary uh, the size of the initial supply, that is Q2. So in these treatments, we keep the trigger prices over here exactly the same as in our control up here. And what we do is we increase Q2 here to five, it means we have to decrease the cost containment reserve, this one. And then in small Q2, we do the opposite. We make the initial supply smaller and the cost containment reserve bigger. Just a few words on the implementation. I won't go into too many details here. Um, in the experiment though, we use what we call neutral framing. So we don't call these um, pollution permits or an auction for pollution permits. We use a neutral framing. We're bidding for like a generic type of good. Uh, our participants only take part in one of our treatments. Um, and we have around six or seven independent observations or groups in each uh, treatment. Uh, we repeat this over 25 auction rounds so that there's an opportunity for learning to take part, to, to occur, whether well, we don't see much actually, much learning going on. I ran these at UQ in 2019, fortunately, before COVID hit. And um, I just mentioned briefly, 
yeah, you might be thinking, how does risk preferences affect bidding in the auction? Well, we did we did collect a measure of risk preferences and control for that, but it doesn't really make much difference, doesn't make any difference to our results. And finally, before I get into the results, um, I should say that we um, randomly redraw the values in each round. So there's variation in uh, what we expect is going to happen and the prices and um, how often the triggers are, are triggered, I guess, uh, across the different treatments. So what's this graph showing you? It's showing you there's the five different treatments. And in each treatment, these uh, vertical lines here are just telling you, reminding you what the trigger prices are in each of those particular treatments. And what we've done in this graph, when I say predicted clearing prices, we're making a strong assumption of truthful bidding. So just to give us something to compare to, assuming uh, truthful bidding and that everyone bids exactly to their values, what will the predicted clearing prices look like? And we can see quite clearly from this graph, you get this bimodal uh, distribution of clearing prices, which are aligned with the trigger prices. Now, of course, this is more pronounced in some treatments than others, but it's true in each and every treatment that we have. Again, this is what we expect from the institutional design, but I'll show you later that this is actually exacerbated by the bidding behavior of the subjects as well. Get into the results now. Uh, first of all, I'm going to mostly focus on the aggregate or market level results, looking at key auction outcomes. I'll talk briefly about individual bidding behavior shortly. So we're going to look at uh, what happens to the final clearing price, how many allowances are sold, and then we're also going to look at how much revenue is raised in the auction, and also a measure of efficiency, allocative efficiency. I'm going to show you all the results graphically, uh, rather than showing you regression tables, but I'm going to report on those figures some uh, significant levels of treatment differences. Those are coming from uh, panel regressions, uh, where we control for learning and all the usual kind of things. All right, so first of all, uh, what do the actual prices look like? So the previous graph I showed you that looks very similar to this, that was where we were predicting the prices based on truthful bidding. What actually happens in the actual experiment? Uh, this is the distribution of prices. And you can see quite clearly, um, again, these vertical lines are the trigger prices in the auctions, uh, a bimodal distribution of prices that are focused on these relevant trigger prices. So that's as we predicted. What's happening if we look at the average clearing prices in each particular treatment? So here I'm taking the average price over all the groups, over all the periods in each of these five different treatments. And first of all, we can see, remember I told you before, we wanna be comparing all of our treatments back to the control because that is where we're just changing one thing from the control to each of the other treatments. So in, control, in the control, the average clearing price is $4.50. In this treatment here, low P2, so this is the upper trigger price, we make it a bit lower. What happens? The average price goes down. Uh, this is a weekly significant difference, so we can significant difference here. Find a stronger effect here when we decrease P1. So this is when we lower the, or decrease the lower trigger price. And then we get a significant decrease in the price down to $3.80 compared to $4.50. So our result 1B then is, uh, as we predicted, lowering either trigger price significantly decreases the auction clearing price. Okay, what happens when we change the initial supply? which is equivalent to increasing the initial supply, which is uh, Q2. Um, well, we can see here, when we have a larger Q2, then we get a decrease in the clearing price. Uh, when we decrease Q2, we get an increase in the clearing price. So again, this is as predicted and relatively intuitive, I think. What 
What about the number of allowances that are sold? Again, I'm showing you the five treatments here in this particular graph, but now these lines here are showing you the initial supply or the Q2 in each treatment, which we do vary in some of these two treatments here. You can see the modal number of allowances sold aligns with Q2 in all of the treatments. Again, it's more pronounced in some treatments than others, and it's not that common to sell more than Q2, uh, except maybe in low P2, but even then it's still not that common to sell more than the initial supply. We compare the mean number of units sold across all of our treatments here. Um, again, this is averaged over all periods in all groups. And what do we find here? Um, so in the control, we sell 3.9 units on average. When we decrease our P2, the upper trigger price, we get a weekly significant increase in the number of allowances sold. But we find no, no significant difference in this treatment here, low P1 compared to the control. As you might expect though, when we look at the two treatments where we vary the initial supply, we do find these strongly significant differences. We're increasing the initial supply, large Q2 increases the mean number of units sold, while small Q2 decreasing Q2 has the opposite effect. We're also interested in looking at what happens to total revenue in the auction. This is something that the regulator uh, is likely to be concerned about, having a sustainable source of revenue, given they spend quite a lot of that on a bunch of uh, different initiatives in their own states as well. Um, so here again, we look at average revenue over all periods and all groups. And in the control, it's around $18. And then the only significant difference we find in treatments is in low P1. So this is when we decrease the bottom trigger price we find a significant decrease in total revenue. And this makes some sense. Uh, if you think back to what I've shown you already, in this treatment, low P1, this is the one where the price goes down significantly compared to the control, but the quantity stays the same as in the control. So it's really no surprise then that total revenue is going to go down in this particular case. In the other treatments, if we've got potentially offsetting changes in prices and quantities going on, which is one of the reasons we get no significant difference across those other treatments. Finally, we compute a measure of uh, allocative efficiency. And so the measure we use here is we look at, given the number of allowances that were sold, were they sold to the highest value bidders? So the way we do that is in each market, in each period, we calculate the following. First of all, we take the sum of the private values of the bidders who successfully purchased the allowances. And then we take that as the ratio uh, to the sum of the highest private values of the same number of bidders. So for example, here, suppose we sold uh, in the auction, five allowances were sold to bidders with these values here, nine, nine, six, six, and four. Then we sum those up and we get 34. And then we look and see what were the five highest values in that particular market. And suppose they're here, nine, nine, six, six, and five. And so this adds up to be 35. And then we take the ratio here to find that allocated efficiency is about 97%. So the idea here is you can see that uh, one of these allowances was sold here to the person with the value of four. It should have gone to this person with a value of five uh, from an efficiency perspective. And what we can see here is uh, this uh, is showing allocative efficiency across all the different treatments. And we can see that um, allocative efficiency is high across all of the treatments. And there's a significant difference only between the control where it's 95.4 and in low P1. So low P1 is the one where we're getting significant differences in total revenue going down, efficiency going up, and also changes in price as well. Just wanna talk briefly about, uh, summarize our market level results. Um, 
So we find that the choice of the trigger prices is crucial as they create these focal points for the clearing price. Clearing price increases in both trigger prices, a lower P1 tilde, a lower, this decrease in the lower trigger price decreases revenue, but increases efficiency. So the regulator might face, face some kind of trade-offs in setting those parameters. The initial supply largely determines the quantity sold, but doesn't affect revenue and efficiency. Now I want to spend my last uh, five minutes or so just talking about some individual bidding behavior results as well. So remember, each subject places two, two bids each round. Um, we only constrain them to be non-negative cent amounts. So we take those two bids, which about three quarters of the time are different for a person, and we categorize them as being a high bid or a low bid accordingly. And then we look at um, how their bidding compares to the theoretical prediction, which is that it's weakly dominant to bid your value for your first unit, and that bidders should bid weekly lower than their values for the second unit. So I've got two graphs here that really kind of summarize um, what's going on with bidding. So this is the high bids here, and it's showing uh, the proportion of bids in the control. The green is overbidding, so bid higher than your value. Red is bid exactly your value. Blue is bid less than your value. So there's quite a lot of bid shading, some bid overbidding and a little bit of truthful bidding. Mostly just wanna focus on the contrast with the next graph, which is for low bids here. We see a lot more blue here than in the previous graph. So a lot more bid shading happening for that second bid. So what we're gonna show is in aggregate on average, bidding is consistent with uh, our theoretical predictions, although there's a lot of heterogeneity in what is going on in the spinning strategies as well. Oh, I don't know how well you can see that. Hopefully you can read that. It's fuzzy, but here what we do is some individual level regressions um, where on the, the dependent variable is the bid, the individual bid, and on the right-hand side, we control for, um, look at control for value, the value they were given, and we interact that with, is it the high bid or is it the low bid? And then we interact that with the different treatments. So the interpretation here is, it's saying in the control treatment, the high bids were around 0.959 of value, low bids were about 0.845 of the value on average. So that's how you interpret those figures. What we can see here, is importantly that on the low bid, these numbers are significantly lower than here for the high bid in each treatment. So we're gonna get more bid shading for the low bid than for the high bid. And this on the next slide, let's go there. We find um, in each treatment, the value of the unit has a positive and significant impact on the bids. For high bids, uh, the coefficient is significantly less than one in some of the treatments, but not in all. But importantly, the coefficient is significantly less than one for low bids in all treatments. So bid shading is happening consistent with our theoretical predictions. And we find no significant difference between treatments. Now I'm running out of time, so I just want to go to two more slides. I want to show you this slide because this is a slide where we can show that um, the focal point effects that we're seeing with prices are coming not just from the institutional design, but also from bidding behavior in the option. So what I'm showing here is uh, the value distribution. So these are the apricot or peach colors here, uh, the values that were drawn in each round. These are roughly uniform, and we're overlaying on top of that the bids, which are these blue lines here. What you can see, though, is that these blue parts here are significantly higher than the purple, which is where they coincide down here, indicating that there's more bidding focused on those trigger prices than we'd expect to see if there was truthful bidding. And we can also see a lot of sometimes what's happening when you get a high value up here, 
There's lots of peach up here indicating that people are not bidding their values here. And in fact, quite a bit of that mass is moving over to the sugar price here. So we can see that bidding behavior is also focused on uh, those trigger prices and exacerbating those um, focal points. I've got one more, so I'll just finish with my conclusion slide and then I'll stop. So what do we do? We use a lab experiment to investigate how the design of Reggie's new dual allowance reserve mechanism will impact on auction outcomes. And what do we find? that the choice of the trigger prices is crucial as they act as focal points. And this is due both to the institutional design and expected, but also made exacerbated by the bidding strategies. So this means the clearing price uh, in the auction could be influenced by the trigger prices, which could be detrimental because these um, clearing price actually provides a price signal regarding pollution abatement into the market. And finally, the appropriate design is going to depend on the regulator's goal. We saw some effects on total revenue and efficiency, allocated efficiency in at least one of our treatments. So there might be some trade-offs going on for the uh, regulator as well. So I think I've run out of time, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Lana. Um, I think we're going to open up the floor for questions. If if you have questions that you would like to pose over Zoom uh, through the chat, please pose it to everyone. Ah, thank you. Um, please, please ask the question via chat to everyone so we can so I can see it. Uh, otherwise, I can't see the question. And if there are questions from the floor, yes, go up. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm not sure if I understood everything, but. It seems to me that you know if uh, clearly the trigger prices uh, seem to have a very kind of influential role in the whole setup, and uh, so why, if that's the case, what, how do we interpret and the fact that the clearing price itself is so responsive to the trigger price? Uh, how do we really interpret clearing price in this setup? And and following on from that. Is there a possible policy role then to actually go for, uh, by design, relatively high trigger prices? So in the, in the latter question, you're meaning because we want to give a, a high signal or something like that? Is that why you're suggesting? Yeah. Um, well, again, I guess it's going to depend on the regulator's goal and um, well, hang on, a high trick, yeah. The reason they have that uh, cost containment reserve is to try and keep the cost from getting too high, right? To stop them blowing out and getting too high for polluters. In your first question, sorry, could you, I didn't quite understand what you were asking in the first question. What? It's a bit hard to hear. I mean, I can hear you, but you're not, it's not super loud, so. So uh, no, I was just uh, wondering, you know, if 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 the clearing price itself is going to be so heavily influenced by the trigger price, which is sort of a policy parameter that the regulator uses, mm -hmm. then um, you know, can we really attach the same kind of um, you know allocative mm -hmm. efficiency kind of value to to the clearing price itself? I mean, do we how? Doesn't that complicate the interpretation of the clearing price itself as a some sort of a price signal, or or am I just missing something completely? Maybe I am. I mean, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's the yeah. I mean, it's still the clearing price where demand equals supply, and given the way that they've set up the the supply curve, right, to be variable. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not quite sure. What else to say on that? If I quite understand exactly the point you're making, but it's not the standard clearing price, but they've already set it up to be influenced by, you know, affected by the variable allowance supply, right? For a reason to keep the price low or keep it high. Well, we have two more questions. One from Hi, Lana. A quick question. So it was interesting to see the 
you know, the soft ceiling and the soft floor. Is that kind of a um, setup common in these markets or what is the political economy of that kind of a setup of a soft ceiling and a soft floor? Is there something particular with this market that the politicians or the policymakers wanted? No, I think it's I think it's more common in these um, in the other auctions that use this type of variable supply as well, because you don't want um, if it's uh, like a hard price ceiling, then of course you just got to keep releasing as many permits as are needed, right? So you can you still want to try and control the amount of pollution, right? So if it's a fully uh, hard price ceiling, then you just have to keep uh, supplying as many permits as are demanded. And that could be problematic because you're not controlling the amount of pollution as, as much as you want to. So there's kind of a trade-off here, right? They want to keep the price from getting too high or too low, but they don't, in the case where the price is high, they don't want to have too much pollution. And that's the whole point of the, the policy. So great paper, by the way. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I've got a really boring question. <laughs> technical one do we know how the amount of you know if you go back to as Oswell and Crampton and the strategic demand reduction argument how much is the bid shading affected by the spread between the two prices can you solve for that you mean uh, experimentally or I mean oh yeah I just in terms of theory like uh, but 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 both actually. I mean, uh, do you get more strategic demand reduction? You know, intuitively, I think, you know, in the limit when the two prices are the same, you get Ozabel and Crampton back. So that should yeah. be their amount of bid shading. And then as you spread them, is the derivative positive or negative on the bid shading? I I can't answer that question. I don't think. Um... Are, imagine it. I'm just doing it in my head, and I it's intuitive, imagine I it's unanswerable. It's, I think it's pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. So um, theoretically, um, we haven't been able to show a lot for the individual bidding strategy because these yeah, multiple unit options are quite hard to analyze. Yep. yep. Um, practically in the experiment, um, we don't find um, any treatment differences in, in bid shading based on the regression that I showed you from individual bidding behavior. Thanks. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the oh, over there? Thanks for the presentation. Um, I was kind of trying to think about the uh, like logic behind why you were saying that for the first unit you would bid different or like you were expected to bid lower for the second unit. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's an obvious explanation, but I haven't quite gotten that. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's to try and uh, pull down the price that you have to pay on the first unit basically. Okay. okay. Yeah, because you're, well, paying, you're paying the highest, um, the uniform price that's paid in this auction is the highest rejected bid, right? So you're trying to pull down the price that's been paid basically is the reason and all these multiple unit options. Okay, thanks. Okay. It's really cool. Um, just on the two kind of comments, one thing is without knowing what kind of rational bid shading should look like, it's hard to then figure out what, how excessive the response of the, of the people are to the focal point. So I think that's kind of connecting these two comments here because then the question is like, what does the rule do in practice when in theory it says this, right? And so we're looking for like, I guess what I was looking for was a bit around, like, can we talk at all about behavioral kind of underpinnings of the excess, the, the, the responsiveness to the focal points in practice and then how that's gonna create kind of forecast error and error in market design when the designer is assuming something like rational, but I know we don't know what that is, so maybe they can't do that. But you know that that's kind of the thing I was looking for was like a benchmark that then says, okay, here's the excessive focal point sensitivity. Um, and and related, I mean, related to that, I was trying to guess if I was a high V person, and I'm like bid shading. I guess what I'd be thinking is, I mean, I'm just trying to be in the lab. I don't want to go in that vertical thing. I'm willing to go there, but I think you auctioneer person or a market designer set the rules reflecting the underlying distribution of things of values like you think it's not going to go higher than there so if i really like it i'll just bid there so that i 
get the the surplus. Um, so I'm wondering also, like, even though you told them it's uniform distributions, you told them all the parameters, I'm wondering if, if the participants are still thinking, no, actually the things you set is what you think it is. Like whether the focal points themselves are affecting people's beliefs about the underlying valuations and the bids that come from it. That was another, I was just trying to, if I was gaming it, that's what I'd be trying to do as a high V person. Yeah, I think well, there's a few things there. Um, first of all, yeah, theoretically, the theoretical predictions, we would love to have more <laughs> precise theoretical predictions about individual bidding, bidding behavior. I think it's um, it's intuitive that they would um, rationally, you know, focus on those trigger prices. I think that, you know, if you're going to bid slightly, you know, slightly above one of them that you might, why why don't you just go you know just to where you just trigger it that kind of thing that you would take your bit down a little bit further than that um and i think our point is that um we're not really saying that bidders are necessarily irrational in what they're doing and i guess behavioral in that sense but we're sort of making the point that um bidding behavior um can exacerbate these focal points it may be quite rational for bidders to do that but i think one of the things that's missed in some of this um experimental literature is how the auction design does affect bidding behavior, right? A lot of times it's assumed that the demand curve doesn't change when um, it's just your marginal abatement costs and is not affected by the design of the auction. So I agree, it would be great to have um, more precise theoretical predictions. We haven't been able to do that as yet, um, but I still think um, we make it a good point that um, bidding behavior does affect the outcome and it's an important thing to consider as well. I think your second point was about whether they believe the uniform distribution. Is that more what you? Um, well, just whether the focal yeah. points affect their beliefs about the underlying values, even though you've said these are yeah. distributed. Whether people just say, "Well, yeah," but I've, I'm inferring something from the rules themselves, and whether that's also causing some of the behavior. Yeah, like I, I, don't, I don't know quite how we'd um, try and test that. I guess that's. Uh, potentially something that's common across lots of experiments where they might not believe what you say. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure how we would go about testing that actually. Other than hopefully they see over the course of a number of rounds that, you know, 25 rounds that they get a reasonable sort of range of draws from that distribution across that time it makes it more credible. Well, um, let's thank Lana again for a fantastic keynote. Thank you. Um,